Okay, here we go. Focus, speed. I am speed. One winner, 42 losers. I eat losers for breakfast. Breakfast? Maybe I should have had breakfast. Oh, well, brekkie could be good for me. No, 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 stay focused. Speed. I'm faster than fast, quicker than quick. I am lightning. Hey, lightning, you ready? Oh, yeah. Lightning's ready. I'm American made, but a large Chevrolet. So, people don't seem to like cars, have you noticed? Critically speaking, anyway, people don't like the character design. They say the story is overly simplistic. They think it's visually quite boring. However, I have a hot take. I think Cars is a good Pixar movie. Well, it's it's fine. I mean, it's fine, guys. Guys, come on. It's it's fine. It's definitely not bad. Here's some personal information. I was seven when Cars came out, so ideal age demographic, and more importantly my parents were absolute petrol heads. They used to run car clubs when I was a kid, and my dad is currently building a car here on YouTube where he is just crushing me statistically. So as you can imagine, I've watched Cars a lot. Probably more than any other Pixar movie if I'm honest. I also played the video game a lot. It was very good. Which might make you think I have some nostalgia bias here. Probably, yes, but I said my parents are big petrol heads. I'm not. I don't even drive. Yes, I am a huge disappointment. But hey, I still like cars, so I want to talk about why I like cars instead of talking about why I don't like cars. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about cars and not the fact that I don't like cars. One of the most common complaints about cars is that the world of cars doesn't make sense. How did cars build these things? How did cars hang things up on the wall? How does this car access his own luggage? And you know what? That is 100% valid. This movie makes absolutely no sense. I disagree, however, that this is a movie ruining problem. And I have two answers as to why. One is what I consider the cop-out answer, but also the more fun answer. Hey, I have a question for you. How did the monsters in Monsters, Inc. discover that children's screams were a great source of power? Before they discovered that, they had to invent interdimensional travel, so presumably they had a way of generating power before this. How does this interdimensional travel work anyway? Is it magic? It doesn't seem like magic. How do they know which doors to make, since the doors have to match with the doors of the closet they come out of? Does the machine that makes the doors just know which doors to make? Are we sure it isn't magic? Hey, I have a question for you. How are the toys in Toy Story alive? Is it magic? It doesn't seem like magic. How do they know they can't be seen alive by humans? How did this world order come about in the first place? Who draws their name on their toys? Is that a thing people do? Hello there, could you please answer my question? How does a rat control a human man by pulling on his hair? Is it magic? It doesn't seem like magic. You get my point. Early Pixar films are not hard to pick apart from a world building perspective and I think Cars is really unfairly picked on when it comes to this particular criticism. We don't pick on these other films for these problems because it's understood that these are essential setups for the movie and the story being told. I propose we give Cars the same benefit. The second more messy answer is that trying to make this world make actual sense would be completely impossible so they didn't try. The very premise of this movie has a glaring flaw. Cars aren't born, they're built. And other cars can't be building new cars because they don't have hands. You might then turn around and say, well then, the entire movie shouldn't have been about cars. But if you do that, then you lose the entire hook of the movie. The way I choose to view the franchise is through the unreliable narrator filter. The movies don't have a narrator per se, but our perception is skewed to that of a child and a child's imagination of what is happening. This is a story about people, but we see it from the perspective of cars. Of course, there's the obvious third answer that you have to accept, which is that the cars obviously possess some level of telekinesis. Character design is another point against cars that's brought up a lot as a problem. One that's explored greatly by an old Big Joel video, which I'll be using here to bounce off of. In his video, Big Joel argues that cars shouldn't have been about cars, but not because of the world building. There's a variety of other reasons. Cars can't emote properly, they can't interact properly, they're big and bulky, so there can't be a variety of location. Cars don't make for expressive characters. 
To some extent, this one is obvious. I mean, cars don't have opposable thumbs, they can't pick up things or use a lot of tools. But we can't underestimate how important those things are for building character. Look at this scene in Ilya Kazan's On the Waterfront. Look how Marlon Brando plays with this glove so tenderly and then sits on a swing. He doesn't have to say anything to convey his emotional state. All he has to do is use the objects around him. So how often do you get in here? And cars just can't do this. They can only sit there or roll around. When they're sad, all they can do is look sad. They can't act the part. I normally agree with Big Joel, but I find myself completely disagreeing with this one. The cars and cars are significantly more expressive than real cars. This seems obvious. They change heights. They move their tires in impossible ways. They're definitely not as expressive as humanoid figures, but if cars was told with humanoid figures, then it would just be a regular movie. Likewise, you could exaggerate the design of the cars to make them more emotive, but then you'd lose the movie's distinctiveness. I've had to move from the floor because it was absolutely killing my knees, but that's okay. This is a really intimate shot for this really intimate video that I'm making right now. Anyway, I have a hot take. I think that cars? Maybe. For kids who like cars. The cars could have been more exaggerated caricatures, able to do more emotions, but then you'd lose a key appeal of the movies. Cars is the most realistic film Pixar has ever made. What? Now maybe me or other non-car people can't do this. But the cars and cars are all real cars, and you can quite easily identify what they're supposed to be. Some people say that this is just product placement, but when your target audience is kids, you're not going to be selling a lot of vehicles. What it does do, though, is turn the movie into a bit of a game. Hello. Hi. Hi. We're doing a quiz. Okay. What is that car that you're looking at? That car is... it's quite famous. Uh, I can't actually remember the name. Um, but it's kind of based on like a Dodge Charger, Coronet, Plymouth Satellite and they added the, the huge nose cone and the, the, the high rise spoiler at the back for early NASCAR but I can't remember the exact name, it's got some fancy name that they added on I can tell you if, you, if you're ready to give yeah, up Yeah, tell me, I've, I've, I can't it remember It is the Plymouth Superbird <sighs> See, I had like T-Bird in my head, but I know that that's a, that's a Ford. Superbird, right, okay. Oh, that's obviously a Porsche 911. Correct. That's dark. That's a very dark picture, I can barely see it. it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm going to say it's an Aston Martin. It is an Aston Martin. You think James you Bond one. A DB9? DB5. Five. Ah, okay. That's a James Bond one. That. Okay. Be embarrassed if you don't get this one. Are they obviously Mazda MX-5s, Miatas, or you know, Roadsters as they call them in Japan? I'll tell you what, instead of a picture, I'll just show the video of you making one explodes. <laughs> Best car in the world. Okay. Next? Yes. Okay, that's a V-Dub camper van used by surfers in California all the time. Okay, so you got three and a half out of four on the easy. Okay. So we can move on to the medium. So I didn't get anything for the, the blue car because I couldn't remember the name. No, you That's not fair. That. Okay, next. How's that not fair? You didn't get the answer. Yeah, but I knew what it was. I'm just bad with words. Compare this to other car or racing media aimed at kids and it's actually quite rare. Hot Wheels or Speed Racer or Mario Kart all use exaggerated and completely unrealistic designs. Which puts cars in a unique place to do something interesting. Again, I don't know if this is a real thing outside of car communities, but cars have personalities. In the real world, I mean. People name their cars and assign them personalities for sure. But beyond that, culturally, we know things about a car by what make it is, how old it is, what style it is, what's underneath the bonnet. Let's look at this 1970 Plymouth Superbird. Just by looking at it, we can infer things about it. It's old, but not ancient. It's an American muscle car, a group we generally associate with cowboy hats and country accents. We generally give muscle cars male names because they're big and angry looking, but the Superbird is a gentler sort with this sweeping front end here. Well, Tex, you've been good to me all these years. It's the least I could do. Whatever happens, you're a winner to me, you old daddy rabbit. Thanks, dear. Wouldn't be nothing without you. I think when people complain about the bad character design in these movies, this is what they're not 
not seeing. The cars aren't chosen at random. They're personifications of how we imagine these cars to be in real life. It's not that Cars has weaker character design than the other Pixar movies, it's just a completely different approach to character design. When you picture the personality of a Big Rig or a Porsche or a Hudson Hornet, you probably picture what the cars and cars are. And that's why the cars have to look realistic. If they look like cartoon Hot Wheels cars, then that real world character adaptation would be lost. The characters are, admittedly, simple, but simple doesn't mean bad. The characters that need more depth for the story do get more depth, namely Lightning and Doc. Speaking of which, the story of cars is also a common problem posed, that it's too simplistic, the stakes are too low, the messaging is hackneyed, and maybe even a little bit problematic. We'll get to that. I think that all of these criticisms have some truth to them, however I don't agree that any of them make it a bad film. Let's start with the simplicity problem. The story of Cars is a dude learning to become a better person. That's pretty much the gist of it. Compared to other Pixar movies of the era, it's quite obviously a simpler narrative. However, I don't agree that simple makes it bad. I know I just talked up a storm defending the character designs. But there are limits to what an audience would be able to take seriously when your movie is about anthropomorphic cars. They actually make this clear at the end of the movie when they recreate series scenes from previous Pixar movies, but with cars and it's farcical. Stuck out here in this wasteland without chains! But Mike, the Boomobile's in trouble! She needs our help! You're still not listening! <gasps> or for an even better example, watch Cars 2. You will find the second agent and kill him. The story is exactly as complex and deep as it needs to be, and at least in my subjective opinion it still gives me the Pixar feels. When Lightning goes back to push the king, that's some good stuff right there. And I really don't want to pull out the it's a kids movie argument here. Wait, this is a kids movie, right? Oh my god, is he okay? It is however a movie for kids who like cars, and that's why the racing elements are paid such close attention to both in the script and in the cinematography. Watching some of these shots you can almost forget that you're watching anthropomorphic cars because they look like real races. That's a role that goes for all three movies, but weirdly especially Cars 2, which to me at least has the most interesting race sequence of all three movies at the start of the Tokyo race, but maybe that's just because NASCAR is Boring. Hey, you notice how in the movie they montage through like 50 laps at a time? Yeah, that's because in reality you're just watching cars drive over and over and over again in a circle and it's really incredibly boring. I feel like I've got enough topic. The grumpy mentor and the cocky student is not a new formula. It is in fact the same setup as pretty much every sports movie ever. However, there is a reason this is a popular trope. It works. It makes for good drama, good conflict, satisfying resolutions. And when your target audience is kids, you can introduce them to cliches without having to worry that they've already seen them a million times before. But hey, oh, I mentioned that this movie might be problematic earlier, so let's head back to Big Joel's video to explain this one. And maybe it's just me, but I find the whole American America used to be better message really insufferable. The world was different. Oh yes it was. Ugh. This is not an uncommon reading of the film. And to be clear, I don't even think it's an invalid reading of the film. The movie is very America-centric. I think, however, it ignores the other important meanings of this scene. For one, this is a direct reference to a real-world event. Not perfectly. Radiator Springs isn't real, but Route 66 is, and the freeway that replaced it is. The towns that were decimated by the new freeway were real, and the movie uses this real world event to reinforce its message and Lightning's character arc, slowing down and enjoying life. It's a simple and maybe a little naive to be sure, but I don't think it's an invalid message to share. Modern day life is fast paced and destination focused. Ironically you could take this as a message to walk more, so you take in more sights, but in this particular case I think they meant it more literally. A few years ago now me and my family took a road trip down to Florida. 
I remember it quite well. I remember Harry Potter World. I remember eating lunch inside the Jurassic Park Visitor Center. I remember the extremely good mini golf course just outside the park. Seriously, we went there like three times. I remember on the way back stopping at Washington DC. I remember the White House, the Lincoln Memorial, the Smithsonian. Tell you what I don't remember though, the journey. I know I must have sat in the truck for several days chatting and listening to the radio, but it's all a blur. Actually, tell you what I do remember, stopping at the first service station of each state and taking a picture in front of the sign. And if you've never made a drive like this, you might not understand how weird it is. Almost every service station along the road is exactly the same. Just copy-paste. It's very unnerving and makes you think you're not actually making any progress. In regard to this, this line is completely, extremely on the nose. Look at that. Look, and they're driving right by. They don't even know what they're missing. So while it does play neatly into the main character's arc, it's also literally a movie about how highways are born. And Cars does do an excellent job in showing us what you miss by taking the highway, namely some of the best environmental art of early Pixar. One of the most important parts of the desert is how vast it feels, and the movie captures it perfectly. You can compare that to Cars 2, where the desert shots look like they were filmed in front of a map painting. The soundtrack isn't top tier Pixar, but it's memorable. It captures the NASCAR aesthetic well. It's also not subtle at all. It starts with Life as a Highway and ends with Route 66. The film also has two sequels, a spin-off, a whole bunch of shorts, and several video games, all of varying quality. Cars 3 is a genuinely good sequel that builds off the ideas of the first film to tell an emotionally interesting story. And Cars 2 is, um... No, no, wasabi. Oh, same old, same old. What's up with you? Well, it's, um... (laughs) It's... well... Request, 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 request. It's, um... Okay, they broke rule number one. They made the comedy sidekick the main focus. Not only that, they took the comedy sidekick and put him in a James Bond spy thriller. Cars 2 is a weird movie. Probably the weirdest movie Pixar has ever made. I can't bring myself to say that I hate it because it's just too bizarre. And it generally gets a laugh out of me from time to time. Excuse me. What are you selling? Headlights, monsieur, headlights! <gasps> what the? Do yeah. for one. I give you okay. good advice! Okay. But, um... Let's just say there's a good reason the third movie completely ignores everything that happens in this film. It also breaks my kid's perspective of personified cars theory because the cars do too many human things. In the first movie we only see the cars doing car things. They park in garages, they cruise along the road, they race. In Cars 2, they eat. They sip on cocktails. They go to Japanese bathrooms. They, um... They... They... They piss themselves on stage. It was you leaking oil at the party in Japan. You just blamed it on me. I'm going to stop talking about Cars 2 now. There is a reason that the Cars franchise has endured for so long, and it's not just that it makes really easy toys. Cars are a common part of daily life. We see them every day. We use them most days. Kids developing an interest in cars is not weird at all. And yet, media that focuses on cars for kids is actually quite rare. Hot Wheels Mario Kart Cars. It's a surprisingly unsaturated market. And Cars holds the unique place of being about real cars. A kid could easily imagine their parents' car as a Pixar car in the same way they could imagine their toys being like the toys in Toy Story. If Finding Nemo is a movie for kids who love the ocean, and Ratatouille is a movie for kids who want to be chefs, then Cars holds the important place as a movie for kids who want to be race car drivers. We're finally doing it. We're finally discussing something that I liked, which is very exciting. Star Wars, the final season of the Clone Wars, was magnificent. Start and end. Okay, but Nathan, is it the final season? Because I've seen several clickbait articles.